When I first started the company, I, I wanted a less corporate environment. And I envisioned a workplace that was something like when I used to get together with my friends in junior high school and high school to play Dungeons and Dragons. We just all waited for the weekend to roll around so we could play games, and then we played games all weekend and lived off of um, Almond Joy bars and, and Cheetos. You, know, you couldn't tear us away from playing games, and that's the kind of environment I wanted to create. Somehow he found me and called me up and we talked, had these long, long, multiple hour conversations about the game business. And After several of these, I remember mentioning to my wife, I wonder if he's going to start a game company. And uh, sure enough, in late 1994, he said, I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a, I'm going to start a game development company. I had a consulting company, and one of our lead programmers, Angelo Loudon, and I were working on an accounting application. And uh, we were pretty bored and had been working on that for months. And he had told me that he had always wanted to, you know, write computer games. And I told him I always wanted to start a game company. And by the morning, we were banging out the code for a tank game, which Never got produced, but that's how the company got started. Within a few months of starting, we had narrowed down what we were going to do, the game would be, and I, and I think it was a strong idea, the idea of merging the best of real-time strategy with the best of turn-based strategy into kind of a hybrid. So I think we had a great idea at that time, and then it was just a question of finding the people and, the, and, the, and making it all come together. In the original Age of Empires, we included a learning campaign based on the Egyptian rise to power. It was more or less just an easier campaign, and we tried not to overwhelm the player too much. As we moved into Age of Kings, we realized we needed to really take a step back and actually teach players how to work the interface, how to move units around the screen, how to upgrade technologies, how to fight the enemy. We did this by telling the story of William Wallace, starting off the player with just a, a few military units trying to break free of the English tyranny and gradually get more and more soldiers to build castles and finally get William Wallace himself to help you move on to victory. Our goal was never to let the player think that he was being taught, but to have a fun experience and learn how to play the game while they were doing that. When we do the artificial intelligence for the maps, for the computer player to play against the humans, we have, to, we have two things we need to balance. First is, obviously, we have to game, the game must be challenging for even the best players. The second aspect is it has to be fun for even the newest players, so that if someone's mother or their four-year-old kid are trying to play the game, they have to get an enjoyable experience. The computer player has to seem to put up a fight, but it still has to lose. When, the, when a play, game player is more, more adept and really wants a challenge, we have to have the AI be as powerful as possible to take him out. Formations is a good example of one of the things that we came across when we were trying to make the game more accessible to, to casual players. Um, formations in most games are fairly intimidating. They have a lot of things that you have to do to be able to get your units into formations, and it's a pretty abstract concept. You really can't intuitively figure out what series of buttons you have to click on someone's user interface to get your units into a formation. So the approach that we took with formations was more making it entirely intuitive to a person and entirely automatic. Um, formations in our game, you select your units, you tell them to go do something, they automatically go into the formation they're supposed to be in. It's much easier for people to understand, and it serves the purpose of the formation. Ensemble Studios is very different from other game companies I've worked at for a number of reasons that are not very subtle. One is the way that it's managed and organized. At many game companies, there is, most game companies, there's like the star, the, the, the guy who's in charge of the project, the auteur of the, of the game. There's no stars here at Ensemble. The individual people here would be stars at other companies, but here we work as a team. We're all moved together on a project. Anyone on a project, not just the designer, is able to make suggestions, improvements, be listened to from the uh, financial officers to the front desk personnel. We all work together very closely as a team. One of the things that people think of when they think about games is they think about the fun that goes into the game, getting the game in the box and out on the shelf for people to start playing. But in reality, it takes two, three, sometimes even four years to develop a game. It takes us about 24 months to actually put together a major release like Age of Empires II. We had a lot of people work on Age 2, uh, upwards of 40 people, I think, at one point, um, over 10 programmers. That's a pretty big entourage of programmers to kind of corral and, and work together, particularly when we were all pretty well versed in the engine and everybody could do a lot of different things. It was kind of a juggling match sometimes to figure out which person got which tasks. But then at the same time, we had a couple of tasks that were really only good and suited for one person because of all the experience built up. So I think uh, we did a really good job on the project management of keeping the tasks flowing and keeping everybody busy. 
And again, I think that all comes from the communication and cooperation and respect that we all share as ensemble employees. Uh, Look at the Game is decided by many people, it's owned by many people, it's not just one person, although uh, one person can bring up the initial thoughts of what a game is to look like, so initial sketches are done, a lot of brainstorming, a lot of gathering of reference, and then everyone kind of sits down and puts it up on a board, you start making decisions on how the game will be based off of clear objectives and lots of input. The process that we take to get artwork in the game is first the idea goes to a sketch artist. A sketch artist creates a few drawings, it goes through a review process. From the review process it goes to an artist who builds a model uh, and textures the model. After the model is textured it usually goes to an animator, the animator animates and from there off into the game. We try to make the music act as a mood setter more than a focal point in the game. Uh, we feel that it's secondary to the sound effects. The sound effects give you a lot of information as to what's going on, and we try to complement that rather than overpower it. Traditionally, we use a lot of synthesizers and samplers to achieve our sound, but more recently we've started involving a lot of acoustic type instruments bringing in as much percussion as we can find. Whenever we're out at a store, it doesn't matter if it's on an official trip or not, we find things, we bring them in. We might not even know how to use them, but that doesn't matter. As long as we can make interesting sounds with them, they, they serve a, a purpose. To me, the best compliment is when someone says that they put our game CD in their car to listen to the music. Uh, so while we try to keep it as a background thing, as more of a mood setter in the game, it's great that people feel like they can take it away and, and listen to it on its own. Playtesting is the heart and soul of what we do. Um, there's really no way that anyone can make a game in, in a vacuum. And at least our experience has been that, that the more iterations of the game that you can get out there, the better a game you're going to have as an end result. So one of the things that we embrace as part of our core philosophy is getting a game playable as soon as possible and then getting it out in front of the entire company and having everyone play the game and generating feedback on a constant basis, once, twice, three times a day during crunch time. There's basically a game going on constantly. And we mirror this as we go out. I mean, when you begin the game, you may have a small core of your team playing this game and getting that kind of feedback. When we get a little bit more involved in the process, then the entire company is playing the game. And when we're getting even closer to being complete, we have our beta test where we have thousands of people playing the game, giving us feedback and, and just giving us basic ways to improve our game. And it's really been the process that's worked for us and I think it's one of the crucial things to creating a game that, that people are going to enjoy. I basically know a game is ready personally when the vast majority of the people in the company who are playtesting it, as well as the feedback from our outside playtesters, is, is very positive. I mean, I have to sort of use a, a groundswell of, of, of feedback that says, yes, you know, the, it feels right, people are having fun playing the game. I think the most exciting time of finishing a product is when you actually go out and see it on the shelves for the first time. You can pick up the box with your game in it and go to the cashier and say, yes, I'm going to buy my game here that I worked on. It's really pretty thrilling to uh, know that you can touch that many different people's lives. It can be pretty humbling. The difference between Ensemble Studios and other game companies that I've worked for has been profits for one, and profits means that you can spend money on nice equipment and beautiful offices, and you have R&D budgets, and you have uh, the best equipment. That's one tangible thing. Uh, I think the most important intangible is the way we really try to take care of people. We're really people-oriented. A lot of companies talk about their people or being their number one asset, et cetera, but I think Tony Goodman, as our president, has really made that an important focus. He really is concerned about the people that are working here. I wouldn't really compare Ensemble Studios management to other companies. What I would say though is that we really have a well-seasoned management team that has great business acumen. You know, we focus on making sure that this is a profitable company, uh, producing AAA quality titles. Um, that's been demonstrated with the company receiving many awards and we really try to um, focus on being the best game company possible. Where is the 
future for Ensemble Studios is an interesting question. Uh, people ask me all the time when I'm traveling about that kind of question. They, you know, but I mean, they're usually thinking of five or ten years out, and, and um, I tell them we only need to know what's going on two years from now or three years from now because that's when our next game will be done, and we got to be sure that the next game will be successful when it comes out in two years or one year or three years. So I, I generally don't think in a our, in our horizon larger than that. Um, but I think we know how to make games. Um, we've learned how to make really excellent games. We have a real broad array of talent at, at Ensemble, and we've created a, a real top PC franchise in the Age of Empires. Uh, we're going to go on producing top real-time strategy games, but we're also working on a, a, a really fantastic console game that we think will be a real hit. And uh, sometime down in the future, we're going to be working on uh, online games and possibly a massively multiplayer game. So the future looks bright. <laughs>